Välkomna hit allesammans att besöka och lyssna på vår besökare. Professor Gorido Inbens är här. It's a great honor to have you here with us today. Han gör, har gått runt och träffat elever och nu vill vi höra lite om hans egen skoltid, och om hans väg mot ekonomi och statistik och sådana frågor och hans pris naturligtvis, hur det kan vara användbart. So we listen. So, uh, happy to have you here, and we, of course, like to hear something about your path in life and, and your interest for economy and statistics and things like that, and your memories, perhaps, from your school, and, and so on, and perhaps you can take some questions after that. Well, th thanks, thanks very much uh, for inviting me here. This has uh, certainly been one of the things I was most looking forward to, uh, to in my visit uh, to Stockholm. So last year, kind of after I, I got the, the, the after I was told about the Nobel Prize, at some point they told me they like to have these high school visits, uh, and so I did one last uh, December. But because of the pandemic, that was that was online, and so that was that was obviously much less interesting than doing this in person. But kind of inspired by that. When I went back to the Netherlands uh, last summer, I actually went back to my own uh, high school, and it was that was just really a lot of fun. That was uh, I just had a very exciting uh, day there. And the nice thing was they were actually still in the same building uh, where I'd, I'd been to high school, and, and they're not going to be there much longer. They were about to tear it down, but so now I could actually still talk to the students, and I could tell them I'd walked the same hallways, I'd been in those same classes. Uh, and you know, things didn't always go uh, perfect for me uh, there either. In fact, kind of, they, they had a whole, they, they had a uh, couple of people talk a little bit about uh, the times when I was there, and uh, in particular, they had my old uh, economics teacher talk about that. And there was a, there was a uh, episode that at the time certainly was not quite viewed as favorably. So I was banned from class for a while. I, uh, in, in economics in particular, so I was, I was taking this economics class and I got into uh, basically a, it's an argument with the teacher about a, uh, the, I'll spare you the exact details, but for three weeks I was not allowed in class uh, there. And then it was only at some point that the head of the school found me wandering the hallways and asked what I was doing there, why I wasn't in class. I said, well, I was not allowed in class, uh, so I didn't really have any choice. And then, then it, it got sorted out. Uh, but the point I'm trying to make is that I wasn't uh, uh, necessarily a model student uh, in those days, uh, and it, uh, if, and I didn't do well in all the different uh, areas. But I learned in Europe as amount that uh, at the high school in the end that I, I matured some, and uh, things worked out uh, in the end eventually. Um, so the, the, the other thing kind of I want to uh, talk a little bit about is that you, see, you may look kind of at these people uh, who, who do well and sort of have these achievements uh, and you may think that things go well for them kind of all along the way and that, that's not really the, the right way to look at it. Kind of first of all, people who do so well often just have an enormous amount of luck. There's just a lot of, you know, you can do all the hard work uh, you do, but you just need, you know, there's a lot of, of good fortune in, uh, in doing so well. And, um, and I just want to give a couple of examples there. One of the, the things that, that worked out very well for me was uh, I started collaborating uh, with a colleague of mine in my first job uh, at, uh, at Harvard University. With uh, Josh Angris, uh, with whom I shared the, the prize in economics, but I almost uh, didn't uh, didn't work because when I was applying for a job there, uh, Josh actually didn't like uh, my work and he actively opposed the university hiring me because he thought the work was uh, was no good, and so it turned out. You know, Tonight he was wrong, and it, was, it would have been very uh, unfortunate for him if I hadn't actually gone there. But it, it, it was kind of there, there was a lot of luck involved. Uh, he was actually probably right that the work I was doing at the time wasn't all that uh, that interesting. 
But when I got there and, and we started talking together and we started working together, that actually it, it turned out we did have the good complementarities. We had we had things that, that where it was actually very helpful to work together, and uh, the, the, that led that to very interesting work. So kind of one thing to take from that is don't let the first impressions uh, deceive you there, but also just just be a little humble that even if things go very well. That probably was, it wasn't just skill, it wasn't just doing everything right, but it was also a lot of, uh, of good fortune. And so, uh, you know, similarly, my, uh, my colleague and, and good friend, Josh Angris, path to, uh, to, even, to even getting to graduate school was, was very roundabout. He um, dropped out of high school because he was, he was not enjoying himself there, and he started working uh, uh, for a while. He worked for a while uh, in a nursing home. And then somebody realized that actually that wasn't really going to be a very fulfilling long-term uh, path, because the work, it, was just, it was a lot of work, it was very hard work. And so he decided to go back to high school. And then uh, uh, he decided to, actually, then he went into the Israeli army for, for two years. You know, before I actually went to uh, to college and uh, and on to graduate school, but so there's kind of a lot of different paths you can take to to this, to uh, uh, becoming an academic to doing uh, to doing great research, and you shouldn't get discouraged if things don't necessarily go your way early on. And, uh, there's lots of opportunities and there's lots of uh, possibilities uh, at various times. But at the same time, from my perspective, my high school days, which is incredibly important, they were, they were very formative in uh, how I started thinking about society, about what I wanted to, uh, to do. I wasn't really that uh, sure initially I wanted to do economics, but I was, I was uh, good in math, but I wanted to do something that was more relevant for, for society than, than doing pure math. So I ended up doing, doing econometrics, kind of which is essentially economics with a lot of the statistics and, and mathematics thrown in. And that turned out to, uh, to be a very good choice from, uh, from my perspective. I, I can uh, keep talking for a bit, but actually I, I would love to get some questions from you guys, sort of, sort of what, what you guys think about the things. So I think I can talk a little bit more about my, my actual work, but I'd, I'd love to get some questions from you guys about what you want to, uh, to hear me talk a lot. The, so what, do you want, you want me to, this, do people want me to talk a little bit more directly about the work I actually do, or, or do, wanna, do people want to ask questions? Uh, what, uh, you have a question. How early do you think uh, results are, like grade-wise, uh, early in life? for later on uh, jobs and academics? So I think from, so when I grew up, and kind of similarly kind of with, with George, George Angus for the experience, uh, I think grades were not, not all that important at that time. I think uh, sort of unfortunately things, uh, certainly in the, the US system that I'm now more familiar with, it's, uh, it's kind of harder for me to judge exactly how things are say in, in Holland or here. But great, there in the U.S. grades clearly have gotten more important uh, to the point that, that sort of both parents and, and students uh, uh, obsess over that more than, uh, than they should. So, well, uh, and it's sort of partly in the U.S. system, kind of it's hard to get into to good colleges and to get into good colleges and support to get into good high schools and support to get into good uh, the elementary schools to the point that even in, uh, in kindergarten people start worrying about it. The, the funny story there is sort of when, when, not, when my oldest, uh, so not, he's not here, so I can embarrass the, him with this story without him being uh, upset. But he was in kindergarten uh, or preschool, preschool is uh, what it was. Uh, he, uh, he bit one of the fellow students. Now it's very bad in the U.S., uh, and so the, the schools have all these protocols, uh, and so there was a report sent to all the, the parents, 
that there was a biting incident that someone had bitten someone else. Uh, and so all the kids were kind of talking about this. Uh, so it wasn't really clear we'd done it, but it was our son who'd done this. Uh, and then we were worried. I said, well, but if, he, if he's bitten someone, he's not going to get, the teachers are not going to recommend him for a good elementary school. And then he's not going to get into good high school. Then he's not going to get into good college. And he's never going to amount to anything. Uh, and of course, that was a little excessive. Uh, and so it's, it's hard, it's easy to obsess over over grades, and it's, you know, in the end, and the, so the, at least within the U.S. system, the schools and the colleges kind of try to push back on that and try to get the students to do interesting things outside of school and to kind of show creativity, show interest, show ambition, uh, and not obsess over grades, because uh, uh, it, it, it has a lot of leads to very bad incentives where students take easy classes just so they can get the better grades. Uh, so, unfortunately, it is important, but it's not as it's often not as important as, as people think it is. When and I, I deal more with graduate admissions than with, with undergraduate admissions, and we pay far more attention to what students have done other than their classes than the, the grades they actually get. Yes. Did you ever get discouraged when people did not like your work? And if so, how did you get past that? Yes, there, there, there many times there I got discouraged. So one of the times was when I was in graduate school. This, this was in the U.S. and I, I just didn't feel like I was doing interesting things. I didn't feel like I was very good at it. I didn't feel like I was making progress. So I actually started applying for jobs. So that I, did, I was thinking to not finish my PhD the program, but just started looking for jobs uh, outside of academics. And in fact, I, uh, so I was in the US at the time. And so I found a job advertisement where they looked for, uh, for someone who had a master's degree in economics, which I. I just finished at that time, and they wanted someone who was fluent in Dutch. And growing up in the Netherlands, I was was fluent in Dutch, so I thought actually that job was perfect uh, for me. But then I didn't get interviewed for that, and so they didn't go anywhere. So I ended up deciding to just stay in graduate school for lack of better options, and so and it it still worked out. But it's it's very it's it, there's lots of discouraging parts in uh, in. Uh, in academic careers, because what we do, what I do most of the time, is I do research, I write papers, and then I send them to journals, and then most of the time they send them back and say, no, no we're not gonna publish that, we don't like it, we don't, we don't think it's good enough. And so you get, it's, it, it's very discouraging, and it, you may think that sort of now, at this stage in my career, that's actually easy, and it's, you know, it's easy for me to get things published. But the first five papers I got back after winning the Nobel Prize were all rejections. And so it's, it's, it's very hard at any stage of your career in academics. Uh, and it, it, you know, how, do you, how do I deal with it? I, I complain to my friends and, and they commiserate with me. And then you kind of just get back up, dust yourself off, and you keep you keep going. You kind of need to work on things you're inter you think that are interesting, and uh, at some level, the 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 some of the best work that I've done uh, was was heavily criticised early on. It was a paper I was very proud of. I was very happy with, and and uh, again, the way the system works is you submit a paper to a journal, and then they get anonymous people referees writing reports on this and I remember this one reviewer writing that he thought this paper of mine was so bad it wasn't worth the paper it was written on. But it was a little harsh. That was very harsh and I still remember that very vividly and it really hurt me and I, now I'm, I'm editing one of those journals and I make sure that people don't write reports that are quite that harsh because I think it, it really upsets people and rightly so. But it's the you have you kind of 
So you have to find others to share this with and you can realize you're not the only one getting, uh, getting negative uh, feedback and it would be nice if people were a little bit more constructive but you have to find a way of, uh, of dealing with that. And you know, the economics profession in that sense has, has often been not particularly friendly and not particularly constructive. Uh, and that, that's not a good thing. It's one of the things I'm trying to change. Yes. Uh, could you tell us more about your work? Sure. So what, what the, most of my research is, uh, is in, in economics, often we can't do experiments. That's kind of, it, it's, it's just, you know, unlike in medical settings where, where the Food and Drug Administration in the US requires drug companies to do experiments to kind of separate the snake oil from, from real uh, drugs that, that work. In uh, economics, often we can't do experiments. It would be great to figure out what the causal effect is of a good high school education, how important a good high school education is. But we can't do kind of a drug type trial where we say, well, we're going to split this class into two parts and you guys get a high, good high school education and you guys get nothing. And then 10 years later, we're going to look and see how well people do. And now we know for sure that a high school education is actually really important. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. Why does it not work? Well, it would not be fair to the people who didn't get the education just to allow us to learn what the value of that is. So we need to find other ways of learning from the from data to figure out what the value of, of a high school or a college uh, education is. And simply comparing people who have a college education with people who chose not to have a college degree obviously doesn't work. These people may be different in lots of other ways. They may not have enjoyed the studying as much and they may have done worse irrespective of getting of making that choice. And so teasing apart the correlation we see, say between earnings and a college and having a college degree from actually the causal effect of going to college, of getting more education. That's kind of what, what, what I work on. And so I so most of my my own work kind of is is on developing new methods for making that possible. But then sometimes I work with people trying to, to act to actually implementing these methods and other people implement these methods to figure out kind of what causal facts of that type are for, for looking at, at public policy. So for example, and that's kind of one of my more applied papers, we were interested in what the effect of having a universal basic income would be. And again, that it would be very hard to do a randomized experiment where we say, well, you guys are going to get a universal basic income for the next 20 years and sorry, you guys don't. That would, again, not be viewed as fair. That would be very hard. It would be incredibly expensive to do. So what we did is we went to the lottery in Massachusetts and surveyed the people who won the lottery. And so if you win the lottery there, instead of getting half a million dollars, you would get a check for $25,000 every year for 20 years. So it's kind of very much like universal basic income. It's not quite guaranteed forever, it's just for 20 years, but it's kind of a long time. And it's coming from the lottery, it's not coming from the government, but maybe a little different. And it's only for people who play the lottery, they may be a little different from people who don't play the lottery. But we can do, kind of do a lot of additional things. And the fact that at least there was some randomization, who wins the lottery given that you buy a ticket, that's, you know, that's really pretty much random. You know, they televise these things and so so these people were comparable to the people who didn't win, but also played the lottery. And so that allowed us to kind of figure out that, in fact, these people who won the lottery, they worked a little less. They might retire a little earlier, but they didn't really stop, kind of, most of them didn't stop working. And we could estimate very precisely what the effect would be on a variety of outcomes, on, in particular on how much people would actually work. And so, in lots of other settings, we're, we're trying to look at that type of thing. We're trying to look at the causal effects that are important for government policies, for public policy, 
and we're trying to do that in settings where we can't directly randomize the things we would like to do that we would do in a drug trial, but we need to use observational data, what we call observational data, in, uh, in clever ways. Any other questions uh, there? Uh, how did you react react when you got told you, could, you were going to win the prize? Or like, was it expected or? No, no. So you know, it's it's a funny thing uh, where it's like one of these major uh, moments where your life kind of changes. But sort of most most of these other moments, like having kids, you kind of you see that coming uh, at least nine months before. And sort of here, you don't see that coming. So you go to bed. You know, it's in California, so you go to bed, and then at uh, two in the morning, you get a telephone call, and my phone you know, is on this night setting, so it doesn't ring the first time it gets called, because I, I don't really want to get calls in the middle of the night, but it's, the setting is such that if, you call, if they call again, it does actually ring, and so then, then uh, the second time I, I did get the call, and uh, then it's kind of, you, you, take, you take a very deep breath, Kind of they, tell, they, they tell you, well, congratulations, you won this prize, and so you have half an hour, and then you need, we need you to call into this press conference and kind of embrace yourselves because there's going to be a lot of people calling you, and, and your life's going to change for a while. And so it's, it's very exciting. It was very exciting uh, last year because all three of my kids were still at home. My oldest is now in, uh, in college, but so it was, they were all home, so partly because the pandemic. And so I was very excited to celebrate that with, with my kids, other than kind of most of that, that first day was just, I was in a daze because there was just constant uh, calls coming in and people needing to talk to me and stuff. But it was very exciting. It was, it was, it was just really an incredible experience. Any, any final message or advice to our students or perhaps to our teachers how to, how to create interest in, in, in your subjects or something? That's, you know, some of these questions are a little, a little challenging. So kind of just in general, so over the last year, I've had to do a lot of things that, that I wasn't used to, uh, to doing. Probably actually the most, the most challenging uh, thing was I had to uh, give the high school commencement address at my son's high school uh, and so that was a particularly challenging thing because of course I couldn't say anything that, that would embarrass my son uh, but I also had to say something that the teachers would be okay with, I had to say something that the parents would be okay with uh, because we have more kids in the school uh, um, and so you know, one, of, one of these things is also that I get asked about a lot of things that I don't really know uh, much about and I, so we've seen that before, years ago, a colleague of mine, uh, and I said Berkeley, won the Nobel Prize in Economics, and I had dinner with him later with a couple of other people, and uh, we asked what he'd been up to, and he said, well, he'd been to South Korea, and um, he said, well, what, what did you do there? I said, well, I had, had dinner with the finance minister, he said, well, what did, what, what did you talk to him about? Uh, he said, well, you know, I gave him some advice on monetary policy, and we said, but then, you know nothing about monetary policy, because uh, he was an econometrician uh, uh, like me. And he said, well, you know, that's, that's kind of right. But he asked me, so what do I say? And so I don't necessarily feel particularly well equipped kind of to, to give you guys advice. Uh, other than kind of what I said before, I said the, some people kind of just plan, try to plan things in a way ahead and try to kind of have a very clear plan about what they're going to do, what their careers they, will, they want to take. And sometimes they, they do that and it, and it works out. I was, I didn't do that. I, uh, in my case it was much more that, that occasionally opportunities or, uh, came up and I, I, there were choices I could make uh, and I, I 
to feel I was lucky and that I was ready at the time some of those choices came up, that I, I could make a choice and I was willing to make a choice and take a risk. Uh, so, and, uh, as I said, I, I went to England kind of after uh, a couple of years in college uh, and I wasn't as part of a grand plan, but it was because it seemed like an interesting opportunity and it greatly broadened my horizons uh, and that was, that was a really precious uh, thing. So probably if there's any advice, kind of just do broaden your horizons. There's a lot of complicated things going on in the world uh, and kind of understanding other people's perspectives and seeing why other people do things differently is going to be incredibly valuable and the best way to do that is to immerse yourself in, in other communities and other cultures uh, and seeing why uh, why things are different there and why things why that may be very reasonable and why that seems reasonable from the perspective uh, of these uh, these other communities and for me the kind of that was just an incredible experience and having been able to do that multiple times going to other countries uh, has just has been very valuable you have um for sure notice that the weather in Stockholm differs a little bit from what you're used to in California, I think. And um, I think the Students' Council have something to say, of course, to the weather. Uh, yes, we would just like to thank you for visiting us here at Astrid we hope you had a good time, and we have prepared a small gift from the student union to you and your kids. Um, and it is a limited edition piece from our very own merch store, and I hope you like it. Thank you.